Hi, I'm Derek and I'm 36 years old and I am a recovering addict and alcoholic. About the time I was a teenager, turn, you know, 13 I'd say, I, uh, I started smoking marijuana and drinking alcohol heavily. I, I just wanted to fit in with the older kids in the neighborhood. And it progressed into my adult life. First it was just on the weekends or now and then, but then it became, you know, every weekend and then it turned to every day. And at the time I didn't see anything wrong with that. But then it started to affect my friends and family and relationships and whatnot. And then I realized that maybe I do have a problem. I, I hadn't spoke to my father in a while because of the way I was living my life. And I got a phone call one night that my father had taken his life. And that really took me to a whole nother level of depression and just um, feeling alone. I was a, sh a shell of a, of a human being. You know, I, I uh, spiritually and, and mentally and physically, I felt broken. It got ugly. And um, I knew right then and there that if I was going to keep going down this path, it was a path of destruction. And I, I, I just knew deep down inside that I needed God, that that was the only way I was going to get out of this mess. A friend of mine, he had gotten a DUI, and a friend of the family told him about Celebrate Recovery at Mountain. And he asked me if I wanted to go, and I was, I said, sure. You know, I was, I was actually thrilled at the idea that, you know, not only was it a place where I could get some help, but also reconnect with the Lord. The day that I finally put, you know, the, the drink down and, and, the, and the pot down, it was uh, April 24th. 2014 and I've been coming to celebrate recovery ever since it's like my new home like everybody treats you like family and I would I I just love it I found out that I could also be baptized you know here at mountain and when I found found that out boy was I happy and I jumped on the opportunity and today Yes, I lost my father, but I gained the ultimate father in heaven. And I can honestly say that being sober today is, is a miracle, and it's, it's the miracle of Christ. It's been one heck of a journey, but I'm, I wouldn't give it up for anything because the relationship that I have with the Lord today is mean it's, it's so meaningful to my life and he has opened doors that I'd never dreamt possible and I'm very thankful that we have a God that is for the addicted hello mountain it's good to be with everybody. I know there's some guests I, I saw earlier today. Just welcome. If you're kind of new at Mountain, you're coming into a great place. You're in the right place, and this is the right time. We're really glad you're here. Uh, so um, how many of you um, shoveled some snow in the last week or so? Yeah? You? Raise your hand if you can't raise your hand anymore because you shoveled so much snow. In the last week or so, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of you know I'm from Minnesota, so I'm kind of always a little bit of a snob about this whole thing. It's like, no big deal. And so you've been asking me, is this like, are you happy now? And I, this was, this was almost a real storm. <laughs> I'll give you that. Uh, you know, my folks from Minnesota, and they're kind of unimpressed by all this, you know, and they're like, well, did you get anything over there? Or what's all the hype about? And so I, I took a picture out in my yard and sent it to them. This is the picture I sent, it's just to give them an idea of... <laughs> What we were going through out here, you know, just because it's not Minnesota doesn't mean we get real snow. So, you know, uh, pretty much everyone's sick of it. Are you sick of it yet? Yeah, yeah. No, well, nobody is as sick of it as this guy. I took a picture of him on the side of the road. He's apparently <laughs> had it up to here. He wants out. Go to Florida. Uh, so, you know, the timing was perfect. Uh, last week we didn't have services, and so uh, we 
quickly scrambled and put together this service and sent it out. I hope you got a chance to participate in that. Some of you get a chance to do that, I hope, in your homes and, and whatever else. And it was perfect timing with our brand new website, which is mountaincc.org, brand new website. And so it drove, we were trying to figure out, well, how can we get people to go to our website? Well, 57,000 people trafficked our website last weekend and took advantage of the service. Uh, we don't know how many of that, probably six, 10,000 to the service, but that was a great thing. Super proud of the people who put the service together and uh, got that ramped up while you all were home, you know, uh, holding on to your toilet paper and, and eggs and milk. They were here working on Friday and got it all done. And then uh, the new website team got that, their stuff out. So just a great uh, kind of a God incidence there and how that worked out. We're moving forward in our series, God for the Rest of Us. A lot of it comes from my friend Vince Antonucci. The ideas come from him in a book he wrote, God for the Rest of Us. Highly recommended. To, uh, take that home with you. Um, grab it today if you want to. But it's just a reminder that God isn't who we think he is many times. He's not for someone else. He's for us. And we started talking about how he's, God is a God for the broken. It's extremely important to get that. And then last week in the blizzard, we talked about how God is a God for the stuck. And uh, in future weeks, we'll be talking about how God, you know, is a God for dysfunctional families. And how God is a God for the unloved, unloved and forgotten. How God is a God for, for skeptics and atheists and people with lots of doubts. And even a God for those who have been really turned off by the church. Today what we want to do is talk about some things that I believe are going to turn the key and swing the door open and set some people free. Take a look at this picture. This is a guy named Ray Hinton. Uh, Ray Hinton was 30 years old when he was convicted of murdering two restaurant managers and sent to Alabama's death row. When he was 57 years old, 27 years later, the Supreme Court got looking into it and discovered that that conviction was all based on this kind of racially motivated and shoddily conducted trial that resulted in jailing an innocent man. And so they sent him back for another trial, and uh, of course, this time around, uh, with the, the modern evidence and all, Ray Hinton was exonerated. And 60 Minutes ran a feature on this. It's fascinating to hear this guy talk about what the horror was like in prison for him, especially where he was in so much of his time in solitary and also right down the hall, literally being able to smell the wafting odors from the electric chairs. He would watch one and then another and another go, knowing that he was next, inevitably on his way uh, to death. And, you know, it was just an interesting description of a life. He said technically breathing, alive, but not really living imprisoned there. And you know what? There, there are millions of people, many of whom are in this room and listening to my voice right now, who live the exact same way. Not literally in a jail cell with bars, but very much imprisoned. People who could and should be free, but who are very much not free. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I think all of us know what I'm talking about. Sin has a way of getting its hooks in us and not letting us go, taking us further than we wanted to go with it. And one of the most infamous ways that Satan, our spiritual enemy, uses to get his hooks in people is by leading us, convincing us to, to turn away from God for our primary source of sustenance and life and hope and joy and to turn to something else or to someone else and to, to try to find ourselves there and to, to seek out in this other thing, person, substance, whatever, a way to maybe numb our pain or find our joy or to escape life or to feel good or to have fun or to latch onto it in some way that'll add meaning and depth and just kind of just help us along. And what happens is when our heart latches on, sometimes it, it gets stuck in there and follows that thing where it takes us. And that thing becomes something we need in ever-increasing measure to sort of get back to normal. And before long, this thing that we thought would bring us relief becomes the, the thing that has now entrapped us. We find ourselves living in a prison of our own making. Sin itself is addiction. <laughs> addiction is sin. And addiction is sin. And 
We all know what that's like to live as a slave to something that we feel unable to sort of change and yet it's the thing that we need and want and yet it's the thing that we hate the most. It's like jail and it leads to a kind of hopelessness, doesn't it? It leads to the robbing of so much from our lives. Um, addiction robs you of good years and good days and good relationships. It robs you of good, real good feelings. It robs you of joy. It robs you of hope. And it's a place of horror where you're technically alive. You're going through the motions. You're raising a family. You're living. You're going to work. But really, there's this thing that sort of just keeps you trapped. And you come to just like Ray Hinton, accept it and resign that it's the way it is on death row. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would have felt like for Ray Hinton that day when they told him he could go free? Can you kind of feel that, what that would be like for him when the door swung open and they pointed to the shafts of light and said, you can go. You have a future again. It was on 60 Minutes. They ran a story on this and Scott Pelley asked him that question and he was like, I, I felt like I was walking on clouds. I was afraid to believe it. You know, he just went through the emotions and how odd and you know, crazy it was for him to be free because he didn't think he could be. And a lot of people live like that. First place he went was to the cemetery to visit his mother who died thinking he was going to do the same in prison. Addictions like that, we lose, a lot, we lose a lot while we're locked up by way of relationships and things that matter to us. Hinton says, it was my abiding faith in God instilled to me by my mother that helped me survive decades in that eight by five foot cell. And then he says this, my faith teaches me that God may not come when you want him, but he always on time. Friends, Ray Hinton didn't know if he'd ever be free. He didn't know. He thought he might die there. But friends, he walked free from that prison cell. And so can you. So can you. From whatever is confining and holding back, imprisoning you, whatever power, whatever stronghold, whatever addiction, whatever thing it is, you can and should be free. And We want to strike that note of hope today and swing some doors open for some people. Because God wants to do for you what happened to Ray Hinton. There is hope. I love this saying we've been talking about in recent weeks. When God intends to make something wonderful, He begins with a difficulty. And some of you are like, okay, maybe there's hope for me. My life's pretty difficult. I love the next part. When He intends to make something very wonderful, He begins with an impossibility. Great. You got something impossible? Super. God might have something special up His sleeve in your life. And there's nothing more impossible feeling than the grip of addiction when we feel totally powerless to change something that we really want to in our lives and we've tried and it can't and then God comes and reminds us nothing is impossible with God. I was with the elders the other night and one of our team members, Eric, was talking about this, giving a devotion and he shared these words. He said, every miracle starts with a problem. I thought, that's exactly right. You know what? You want a miracle, it's because you've got to have some problem, right? So you got a problem? No problem. God's got a miracle. You don't have a problem, you've got a problem because there's no miracle going to happen. If you've got a big problem, big miracle. Some of you need to have that word of hope leak into your cell today. I love this one. A reminder that, that addiction, it, it's a manifestation of our brokenness and we're all broken, right? And, and addiction becomes one of the ways that our brokenness comes to the surface. But friend, brokenness is where the light gets in. If we'll acknowledge the brokenness, even if it's addiction, that's where the light comes in and begins to heal. And that's what we want to talk about, a God for the addicted who gets in even in that brokenness. We're talking to people who may be finally ready to admit that something in your life is a little out of control. Maybe you should try to do something about it. We're talking to people who may be dumbfounded, surprised, embarrassed, even ashamed of the fact that you find yourself in a place where there's something you can't stop, even though you've tried. You can't fix it by yourself, and you know it's time. We're talking to people who are in denial that you've got any kind of issue at all because mostly it's everybody else overreacting, and they just need to give you a break or actually to feel sorry for you. We're talking to people who feel justified in the way they use or abuse or get into stuff because it's kind of 
not your fault. It's the circumstances around you. It's the stress in your life. And if my wife would love me better and if my boss weren't so crazy and my parents weren't so stupid and life wasn't so stressful. And we're talking to people who love someone who is imprisoned, who have some kind of addictive behavior that's locking them down. We're talking to the codependents who enable and perpetuate the problem with, without meaning to. We're talking to those people who love others who have played all their cards perfectly but who have still found that they can't control the actions of someone they love dearly and they're tortured themselves as they watch them ruin their lives and run back into the cell of their own making and close the door. And we're talking to people like us, the rest of us, all of us, who know what it's like to have power at work in us and through us and around the world that somehow greater things that get their meat hooks in our heart and take us to places we don't want to go, make us stay places longer than we want to be, and, and people like us who just know that we have turned too often to some substitute for the God-shaped hole inside of us, and when we do, it always leads us someplace where we can get stuck and find ourselves in prison. And to people like us, to the rest of us, comes on the scene this rogue traveling rabbi named Jesus, this upstart who comes and they say, Jesus, what's your campaign going to be about? And the first day on the job, he steps into the synagogue, grabs the scroll of the Old Testament from the book of Isaiah chapter 61 and says, here's where I'm going with this, y'all. And he reads, it's recorded in your Bible in Luke chapter 4, it says this, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, and he has anointed me to proclaim, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Friends, that's why God sent Jesus to set prisoners free. And Jesus says, you know what? You'll know the truth and when you do, that truth will set you free. And then he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And if you've been set free by the, you've been set free by the Son, you'll be free indeed. And a lot of people in this church have experienced that truth. And I hope many more will as a result of what we're doing through this series. And we want to talk a little bit about addiction. There's a lot going on with this. It seems, doesn't it seem like it's, there's more ways for us to be addicted than ever before in our society? Doesn't it seem like it's more prevalent? It's not just that we're talking about it more. I think it is more widespread. It touches all of us. It's an equal opportunity in prisoner. And we're realizing it's not just substances. It's so much, so many things in life. But, but there, there, are, there are so much going on. In the newspaper, you can't go a single day without another one of our young people dying of heroin. It just seems it's a scourge in our community. Crack and meth on the rise, prescription painkillers off the charts, synthetic pot, now the big buzz, amphetamines, bath salts, cocaine, ecstasy, inhalants, GHB, mushrooms, LSD, glue, nicotine, alcohol, on and on and on. We're addicted to food and addicted to purging ourselves of it. We're addicted to porn. We're addicted to love. We're addicted to relationships. We're addicted to sex. We're addicted to video games and Netflix and Facebook and our phones. And we can find a whole lot of things to latch ourselves onto. And then they become these prison cells for us, don't they? Mike found that gambling was exhilarating, kind of gave him a buzz, and it was just safe because it was only 25 bucks, enough to be interesting, but not enough to set him back. And it got more exhilarating when it, the numbers got higher, the stakes were higher. And when he won $5,000, he was hooked. But then, never mind the fact that he lost $20,000 trying to win 50, and that's when the lying started, and that's when the borrowing started, and the begging started, and the stealing started, and his relationship with his wife started disintegrating and by the time she finally figured out a couple years later where all the money had gone and where what he was doing his marriage was gone she was furious because of what he took from the kids started online went to the casinos ended in the poorhouse but it really ended in prison for him the young man in this community was persuaded by a friend to try heroin and uh, he was 15 years old took a hit one hit he was hooked Three years later, they're in a room. He got some bad stuff or too much stuff. They thought it was funny until he collapsed on the floor. And then all his friends ran out the door and the paramedics got there too late. He was dead at 18. You read about it in the paper. And the family lives still in a kind of shock about that. John 
was telling me how it started for him with jello shots in college. And then that led to some more drinking, and before long he, couldn't, he had to drink before first period. And what, what happened is all of that drinking stole from him. It stole his, stole his college scholarship, it stole, stole his career, stole, stole his um, relationship with his father, stole his self-respect, stole his money. His father said to him one day, why don't you just stop it? Can't you see what it's doing? He said, I want to, Dad, but I can't. As he was in prison. He wasn't free to walk out, he didn't think. You can tell me your story. I'll tell you my story. We all got stories. We know what this is like. You can tell me about your porn. You can tell me about your food. You can tell me about all this stuff. We can all talk about this. What I want to do is I want to go a little behind addiction today. I want to talk about, I want to remind us that addiction itself is a symptom of something else. It becomes a problem in itself, so many things to deal with, but addiction is really an indication of something else that's going on. Do we know that? Do we understand that? It's a manifestation of the sin problem. It's a, it's a, behind every addiction, there's pain. And I want to talk about one of the kinds of pain that's so important for us to understand because it can set us, the key to help getting us set free, and that is the word shame. Shame is a powerful, powerful thing. I remember one of the first times I remember feeling something that I think was shame. I was very young, stayed at my cousin's, and um, I wasn't a bedwetter, but that night, I wet the bed. I didn't even know really what was going on. I don't remember. I just remember waking up and getting ready to go to breakfast in my little jammies, and I felt that warmth down there, kind of strange and wet. Looked down as I was coming around the corner to get breakfast tables. Like, oh. So I bunched it all up and kind of waddled into the... My, my aunt, being very discerning, noticed and discreetly said to me, looks like you might have had a little problem. Can I help you get clean up? I'd like some help with that. I said, I don't believe so. No problem here, ma'am, because I, was, I wasn't willing and ready to say, yeah, I made a mistake. I felt the problem was me, and that's what shame does. See, guilt, guilt is powerful, but it can be constructive. Guilt is when you feel bad about something because you did something wrong, but shame says, no, you are wrong. There's something wrong with you. Guilt is when you recognize I made a mistake. Shame says you are a mistake. Guilt says, I sinned maybe, or I need to be forgiven, and shame says, no, you're flawed. There's no forgiveness for you. You don't forgive what someone is, and it becomes part of written, what's written on your heart and soul, and it comes from a lot of places, and it usually comes from outside of ourselves. We're not born with shame. We learn it. When your father says you'll never amount to anything, that becomes a script tattooed on your brain, and you begin to live that script out. That's called shame. And it holds you back, weighs you down, lurks inside in the secret soul. Don't let anybody see it. When you're abused, maybe as a child, you begin to believe, you know, there must be some reason people are treating me like this. I guess it's who I am and what I'm worth. And you begin to believe that. That's called shame. When your grandma teases you, that, you know, you should really lose weight because the boys won't like you if you're too heavy. But you don't lose weight. That shame teaches you to keep everyone at arm's length for the rest of your life. And even when people try to approach you and get intimate and come close and be your friend, you're like, you don't believe it because you know better because you're not worth loving. See, see how shame works? It comes a lot of different ways in our lives. And for whatever reason, we all have it and we deal with it in different ways and it leads us to different things. Let me kind of picture something that will maybe help uh, you understand how this can lead to such destructive things in our lives. So shame begins here and we all experience it at some level. And what happens is it leads us eventually to act out on, in some way, to act out in some behavior, some substance, some thing that will maybe numb the pain, help me escape, help me kind of just relieve or get away from this or whatever, and there's usually a trigger, a trigger event that leads to the acting out. The trigger might be, it's when I, you know, um, I feel embarrassed or I feel lonely or angry or hungry or tired, or I want to celebrate, or I'm feeling particularly down, or a certain group of people, or certain friends, they can, all these things can be triggers, and then the trigger kind of leads us into that experience, and we learn that Oh, this connects to that, and we get this whole series of events, like an irresistible flow of dominoes that we ritualize in our mind, and we go through it every time. When the, when the trigger comes, we know right where it's going, and it goes back to this thing that draws us in, and sometimes there's psychological and biological and physiological magnets that draw us back to that same behavior, action, or thing we do, triggered by the triggers. 
right? And where that leads inevitably is down here then. We feel good. I mean, that's why, that's why we sought it out. There's a high, there's a buzz. It stimulates our pleasure centers. There's some kind of escape. I feel numb. I forget about my troubles. I, I, I get caught up or the risk of it or the adrenaline pump or the fear of getting caught. All of that is part of what feels good. The dopamine that gets released, all of that stuff. Now, it feels good, but it's always short-lived and it's always shallow. And it leads very quickly. And by the way, the longer you're in this cycle, this lasts shorter and shorter. And it leads us inevitably over here, where I feel bad now. Sometimes it's pretty soon where I just get sick or throw up or spend, hover over the toilet, but I feel bad in physical ways. I feel bad sometimes in just self-loathing, disgust, disappointment, like what was I dinking, what was I doing? And then a, a socially, friends start to treat you differently, or your boss says you made an idiot of yourself, or you get the DUI, or you realize you don't have any money anymore, or your friends change, or your emotions level out. You never have real highs or lows. You don't laugh or cry normally, or you just, you have all of these things. Your world just shrinks, and it becomes more self-oriented and you realize it and you say, man, I've got to do something. I'm going to change. That was the last time. And you're certain that you're, you're not going to do it again, but you know deep down you will because you're just a bad person who can't stop. And then the shame escalates and the trigger comes and we act it out and the cycle continues, rinse and repeat. And this spinning is a drain that leads people straight down into a prison cell that many never escape from. And if we just pay attention to just, boy, we got to stop acting out, that's just a symptom. The addiction itself, and, 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 or, or if we think, I just want to forget about everything else and just trying to get back to this high, it'll kill you. Or if you just want to say, you know, I'm going to forget about all these and I'm just going to try real hard, I'm going to try harder now. If we don't address this issue right here, nothing will ultimately feel free and be whole and healed. Let me tell you about someone that um, figured a way out of that cycle. Open your Bible to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. And uh, Vince was talking about the same woman in his book in a chapter here on, on uh, addiction. Open your uh, or phone or wherever you keep your Bible app and go ahead and look at Mark chapter 5 verse 24. It says in verse 24, there's a large crowd following Jesus pressing in around him. Can you see the scene? Big crowd walking down a dusty road, everyone trying to get their selfie with Jesus, right? Okay. That's what's happening here. Now, look at this. It zooms in on one woman in the crowd. A woman there had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. Now, we've talked about this woman before, and I always want to remind us, that's a terrible thing for anyone to suffer, a terrible thing for a woman to go through, but especially in that culture because she would have been considered unclean, untouchable because of the cleanliness and purity laws they had. Religiously and in their society, she was unclean. They had very particular laws and rituals you would have to go through when there were bodily fluids associated. So a man, if a man would emit um, bodily fluids of a certain kind, then he would have to go through a ritual of purification afterwards to be clean again. And a woman, during her monthly cycle, she was considered unclean, and anything she touched was unclean, and after it was over, she would have to go through this purification ritual. Well, her problem was worse because it never ended. And the Bible actually said in the Old Testament Scriptures, under the law of ritual purity in her culture, in ch chapter 15 of Leviticus, says this, when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days at a time, other than her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond her period, well, she'll be unclean as long as she has the discharge. And what's worse is it goes on to say that anything she touches is unclean, and anyone who touches anything she touches, they are now unclean. So this woman, you see, she's isolated. She's cut off. She's a pariah on society. She's walking pollution. And her biggest problem now is not that her body is broken, but that her soul is broken. And this is a woman, there's no question, the kind of shame that she lives with, drowning in it. Brene Brown writes a lot on this concept and has this to say about shame. It's the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we're flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance or belonging. And that's what that woman felt, and some of us feel that way too, deep down. And when you look at this woman and her experience, it really describes the life of an addict. 
I mean, think about it. Verse 26, she had suffered a great deal, so much pain. And it had gone on over the years. How long is this going to go on? It's been for years sometimes, months. You keep thinking it's going to stop. It doesn't. Spend everything she had to pay. Think of the cost financially and in so many other ways. But she'd gotten no better. In fact, she'd only gotten worse. Does that sound familiar to any of us? This irreversible cycle of hopelessness. And yet this woman, she heard rumors about this traveling rabbi, Jesus, and he had shown up places and he was from God. He had power, but he was also good. Power and goodness together. Now that's something that will make you hope. And she had heard that he was touching people and they were healed. And she wondered if that's something that could maybe happen for her. Just like some of us are wondering if that could ever happen for me. Could the power and the goodness of Jesus affect my life? Or is that just for everybody else? And she figured out that Jesus was her last hope, just like we eventually will figure it out. He's our last hope. But how? How can she approach him? She can't even go out in public. She can't get in the crowd and mix it up. She can't touch anyone. So she just has to kind of be invisible and try to just... Hide in her shame, and that's, that's what happens to us. The thing we need the most, we won't approach because we can't, and we're stuck in a prison cycle. You ever wonder how long it took her to muster up her courage to reach out and touch Jesus? Verse 27 says this, She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd, and she touched him. His robe. Can you see the woman working away? She makes a decision. She musters up her courage to go for it. Dive. Make her move. You know, in Celebrate Recovery, we have an awesome community. You heard Derek talk about every Friday night. But it's scary sometimes to make your move and go. One guy, he, uh, he came in the first week. He only got halfway into the commons here at Mountain Road where we meet. He only got halfway in. He didn't go anywhere near the cafe where, the, where everyone's hanging out and doing the meeting. He, just, he got in. Someone said, would you like to come in? He said, I can't do that. Fidgeted, walked around, and left. Came back the next week, though, and he went like three quarters of the way through the commons. You want to come on in? No, I can't do that. And he left. The third week, he got all the way up to the door of the cafe and looked in. And the fourth week, he didn't come back. But the fifth week, he did come back, and he actually went right inside the cafe door just to see what was going on, checked it out. They said, would you like to stay? He said, I can't do that, and he left. In the sixth week, he didn't come back. But on week seven, he came, he went in, went into the cafe, and someone said, would you like to join this small group and just visit because there are people who are dealing with the same things that he was struggling with? And he said yes. And now he's part of that group, and he's filing wholeness and help. But it took him seven weeks. I don't know how long it took this woman, maybe all of her 12 years. I don't know how long it's going to take you. But at some point, we dive, we make our move. We trust that the goodness and the power of Jesus will be there to meet us and help us. You got to make your move. You got you to make your move. Verse 28, I love the faith of this woman. Faith and desperation are a powerful combo, Right? Faith and desperation. Look at this. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Powerful combination. And then this beautiful word in Scripture. She's got a big problem. She's about to have a big miracle. Verse 29. Immediately the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she'd been healed of her terrible condition. Amazing. And somehow God did that in that woman and she was healed physically. Now, my friend Vince pointed out, notice, though, that she's focused on her body and the physical healing, the problem with her blood. But we all know something she probably didn't fully realize in the moment, and that is that there's something much deeper inside of her that still needs healing, right? There's something about her brokenness and her shame that's still broken. Her primary problem was not her bleeding, friends. It was her shame. And so she's received healing from her bleeding. She thinks she's going to slink away in the crowd now and just go back home and be okay. 
Shame doesn't let us present ourselves to people. See, it sabotages our efforts to be authentic. We can't ever take our mask off because we know if we did, we wouldn't be accepted. It's impossible to be real when you're ashamed of who you think you are. I read a book recently called Scary Close by Donald Miller, and he really helped me understand something here. Let me draw a picture. This is what he says is true for all of us. There's a real you right here. It's the you you were created to be. It's a beautiful you, okay? It's who you're supposed to be. But the problem is that somewhere along the line, we... Be- we start to believe that the real you isn't good enough, that we're unworthy. And so we have this feeling that just engulfs us that we're not really lovable or worth loving, and that feeling that engulfs us just kind of hides us to protect us. It's called shame. And you don't want anyone to see the real you because the real you's not lovable. And that shame just becomes this coating around us. But you don't want people to see your shame either. That's no good. And so what we learn to do is create a false self around that, a version of ourselves that we put out there to the world to try to win approval, to try to be loved, not the real us, but some version of us, so we become that successful guy or that smart girl or that achiever or that funny person or that, that person who's, who's easy to create a, a version of ourselves that maybe the world will accept. And what's needed for us, the, 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 the you and me that's hiding down here, is for some power and goodness to break through that outer ring of the false self, through the shame, all the way down to the real you and me. And that's what Jesus understood, and that's what he does for this woman. If you look at verse 30, he doesn't want to let this woman slip away into the crowd, even though she's been healed of her physical healing. Verse 30, Jesus realized at once healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and he asked, who touched my robe? Of course, the disciples pick up on that. They think it's funny. Verse 31, they say, he's just have a look. The crowd pressing in on you. How can you ask who touched me? Jesus, everybody touched you. But he kept on looking around to see who had done it because I think he knew this woman, even though she's physically healed, she needed more. And what I love about this story is what happens next. This woman could have just slinked away as she turns back toward Jesus and she dared to trust Him that He didn't just have power to heal her but that He had goodness in Him to help her. And in a moment of frightening vulnerability, this incredible moment happens when she finds a deeper and more important healing from the symptom. Verse 33, the woman knowing what had happened to her physically, came and fell at the feet of Jesus and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Do you see that? When we learn to speak our shame, that's the key to our healing. We begin to walk out of our prison cells when we can tell our story and speak the truth. And this woman, she came to Jesus, trusted him, and she spoke, she told the whole truth. Have you done that? Have you ever done that? To speak the whole truth to Jesus. And she does it before some others as well. And until we do, we're in prisons of our own making. And look at Jesus' response. Look at his response to us, my friends. Verse 34, Jesus said to her, daughter, beautiful, daughter, beautiful. Your faith has healed you, and I think in more ways than one now. So go in peace, finally, peace, and be free, free from your suffering. It's the only time Jesus called anyone daughter in Scripture, a term of endearment. Can you imagine what that meant to her? Her dad probably wrote her off years ago. He couldn't even be around her. She couldn't even go to the temple to worship God. She hadn't touched her own son. Her own husband hasn't touched her in 12 years. And he says, you are not unlovable. You are not unfixable. That is not your primary identity. That is not who you are. You are a dearly loved child. You're you're a daughter. That's your identity. That's who she is. Her biggest problem wasn't her blood. It was her shame. And he broke through all these things right down to who she was. And in that moment, that woman was free and healed 
as a child of God. And those are words that every one of us needs to hear from Jesus today. To come to him with the same, maybe fear, but trust that that woman had. And then to hear him say, my son, my child, my daughter, you're free and you can have peace at last. I hope you hear those words today because we're all like that. We all know what it's like to be that woman, to feel cut off, to feel like we're messed up to the place where we're untouchable, something wrong with me. I don't know how to connect with others. I've got this problem. It's become who I am. It's hardwired in now. And when you have the encounter with Jesus, he changed her life and he can change yours too. I hope you believe that. I want to plant the seed of hope in someone who needs to know they can walk out of that prison cell today. (laughs) Romans 8 says this, if God is for us, Who can be against us? Think of all those people who told you those lies that that you believed and now is your shame encircling the real you. Think of the you that beats yourself down. But if God is for us, who can be against us? Well, the answer is no one. And so we've got to learn the love of God is reckless and powerful and strong. And it is a God who can be for serial killers and can be for Adolf Hitler, can be for anyone who comes back to him. You come to him like that woman came, humbly, even scared. He will meet you with the same love and power he met her. God is not your enemy. He's your friend. And at your worst, he allowed the worst to happen to his son so you could be free. A lot of people are finding their help and their hope and their freedom in Celebrate Recovery around here. And I just want to make sure you know, hey, that's an incredible place where you'll find open arms, no masks, welcome, and a readiness just to help people come on in and start their journey toward the life they're meant to, to get past the shame and the pain. It's not just about drugs and alcohol, although that's a big part of what, what, what can be helpful there, but anger, gambling, you know, men's purity, or a family group, or someone around me is struggling, or I'm not sure what my deal is, but I know I need help. I just want authentic friends, and that's what this is. It's a place, if you think that sounds interesting, I just hope you'll, you'll give it a shout and, and, and try it out. It's broken people helping broken people. Find help and hope and healing in Jesus' name. And we're celebrating 10 years of changed lives like Derek's, at Celebrate Recovery, and we're having a big blowout this Friday night, and y'all are invited. It's a way to just come and say, we love what you're doing here. We love that you're a reflection of this church, and we want to be part of it. So come on out. You're welcome to join them. And uh, some of you just want to go and celebrate it and applaud. Some of you are going to maybe check it out and say, I'm just here to celebrate and applaud them. But really, you're checking it out for yourself. That's great. That's okay. And uh, just remember, folks, we're all in a process. We're in a journey here. That woman, she was healed instantly. And I've known a lot of people that happened to them with their drinking, their smoking, which is like that. Incredible. I know a lot of other people, it doesn't happen that way. It happens over time and process and there's some ups and downs and it's a journey and we need each other. That's why we have this place called Mountain and that's the kind of church we are. I think of it, it's like like helping your kid learn to ride a bike, okay? Remember teaching your kids to ride a bike? Helping him along, right? Here's a picture of a kid learning to ride a bike. Tell me, is that kid anywhere close to learning how to ride a bike yet? The answer is no. He's got to have some help, right? And of course, inevitably what happens when you're learning to ride a bike, when you're a new bike rider, what happens? You fall. Here's a kid who did that, right? A lot of tears, a lot of whining, a lot of crying, got a bloody knee. It's going to take a while. But what do we do? When my kid falls off a bike, what do I tell him? I say, you idiot. Get out of this family. And get your stupid bike out of here, and when you learn to ride it, don't you come back. Right? Is that what I say? No. It's not what I say. I say, hey, oh, hey, good job. You went eight inches. You went eight feet, whatever it is. You say, good job. I, you fell. Hey, everybody falls. And I help them, dust them off, and get them back up. Sometimes you got to sit down and cry with them a while, and then you wipe it off. You say, okay, come on, let's go. And you get back up, and that's what this church is, friends. It's a place where we're all, we know we're learning to ride, and it's a process for most of us, and we're going to make some mistakes. We're going to fall. When we do, we help each other up, dust each other off. Sometimes you sit and cry a while, but you say, let's go. We're going to go forward. And we want to change. We want to grow. It's grace and truth. It's not just truth. You fell. Get out. It's not just grace. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's grace and truth. We want to change. We want to grow. And when we do help each other, help each other, we go forward and we ride right out of the cells of our own making and we can find freedom in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. God, help these people, Lord, to have the courage to do what that woman did. Help me to be vulnerable like she was and to trust your goodness and your power so we can find our freedom in you, Jesus. We pray it in the name that is above all names, the power 
broker Jesus, the liberator Jesus, and all God's people said, amen.